Okay, thank you. Uh, so um, thank you all for coming. And uh, first, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak at this workshop. It's a real honor, and I'm very happy to be here. Okay, so today I'll be telling you about some uh, recent work that I've been uh, doing with Giuseppe Mattone, who is a graduate student at USC. And it's about these things we call positively ratioed representations. Okay, so this is not a real word. I'm taking a past tense of a noun. But this is the best you could do. Okay, we are mathematicians. So uh, what are these? These positively ratioed representations are a particular kind of surface group representations. Okay, and maybe to, um, uh, to, to, to give you a mot some motivation of why we consider this type of representations, let me start by explaining to you a class of examples. Right? And these are Hitchin representations. Okay, so for the rest of today, I'll let S uh, be a closed uh, orientable surface, uh, connected as well, I should say that. Okay, of genus at least two. Okay, and I'm going to denote the fundamental group of the surface uh, by gamma. All right? Now, um, the, the, the tightness space of S, right, is an object that we've already seen uh, in this workshop. And there are many ways you can think about this space, okay? But I'll, I'll be thinking of this in two different ways today. The first way is as the deformation space of hyperbolic structures on S. Okay, or if you want the set of isotopy classes of hyperbolic metrics you can put on your surface, okay? Um, but you can also think of this from a representation theoretic point of view, and this is the set of discrete and faithful representations. Rho from gamma uh, to the orientation preserving isometries of the upper half plane, which is PSL2R. Okay, consider up to conjugation by PGL2R, right, which are the isometries of H2. Okay, <clears throat> now you can now, next we consider this uh, homomorphism, which I call Yota N. So this goes from PSL2R to PSLNR. And this is a, a homomorphism induced, the homomorphism induced um, by the linear SL2R action. On the n minus one tensor, the n minus one symmetric tensor of R2. Okay, so SL2R acts naturally on R2, in linearly. And so it acts linearly on the nth minus one symmetric tensor as well. Okay, and this, as a vector space, is isomorphic to Rn. Okay, so this gives you a way to put SL2R into the linear group of Rn, right? Then you can check that this actually lands in SLNR. And when you projectivize, you get this homomorphism. Okay, it turns out that this is also the unique, up to conjugation, irreducible representation from PSL2R into PSLNR. Okay, meaning that if I want PSL2R to act on Rn, without preserving any proper subspace, then this is the only thing I can do, okay? But for us, right, what this gives us is a way to put tightness space into the space of homomorphisms from gamma to PSLNR. Okay, consider up to conjugation by PGLNR. Okay, and what you do is you take every representation here and you just post-compose it with this irreducible guy, okay, to get it into PSLNR. Right, of course, you need to check that this descends uh, to a map on the conjugacy classes. Okay? So now we come to our first definition. The nth hitching component, which I will denote by hit ns, okay, is the connected component of this space, uh, which I'll denote by xns. Okay, that contains uh, the image of uh, the map ion. Okay, so here it's well known that tight in the space is a connected thing, right? It's a, uh, it's a cell, in fact, okay? And this map ion here is continuous, okay? So the image of ion is some connected subset in here, and you can just take the connected component of this that contains it. Okay, in other words, the hidden representations, which are the representations in here, are those that you can continuously deform until you get something in here. Okay, so this uh, 
space of representations was uh, first studied by Nigel Higgin, uh, and he used the Higgs bundle techniques to understand the global topology of this space. So for example, he also shows that this guy is a cell, okay, just like for typing the space. Okay, but um, the geometric properties of uh, the representations in here right, were very mysterious until uh, Francois Laboury came along and proved this, what I think is a remarkable theorem. Okay, if you take any Higgin representation, rho, okay, then rho is going to be uh, what we today call a NOSOF with respect to the parabolic subgroup, the minimal parabolic subgroup. Okay, so like uh, everybody else, I will not explain what a NOSOF means to you formally, okay, but you should think of this as um, saying that your representation has some very nice geometric properties with respect to some particular parabolic subgroup, okay? And uh, in particular, right, uh, we know that this implies that rho from gamma to g uh, is a quasi-isometric embedding. Okay, so here you put the word metric on gamma. This is a gromov hyperbolic group. And here you choose any left invariant metric you want, Riemannian metric on your Lie group. Okay, also if you take any non-identity element in your group, Okay, then rho of gamma uh, is diagonalizable over R right, with eigenvalues uh, having pairwise distinct absolute values. Okay, and I will denote the, this, this absolute values of the eigenvalues uh, by lambda 1 of rho of gamma to lambda n of rho of gamma in descending order. Okay, so lambda 1 of rho of gamma is the eigenvalue of rho of gamma with largest, uh, is the absolute value of the eigenvalue of rho of gamma with largest absolute value, and so on. Okay? Now choose a, a collection of non negative numbers, a1 to an minus 1. Okay, so that a i equals to a n minus i for all i. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, okay, from now on, from now on. <laughs> all right, so here I'm just picking any uh, collection of non-negative numbers with a particular symmetry. Okay, so I'm really just choosing half of them. And using this, we can define this thing called a length function. Okay, and this is a, 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 a map from the space of closed geodesics on my surface. Okay, so what is this? This is defined to be the set of non-identity conjugacy classes in gamma. Okay, consider up to the equivalence relation where the conjugacy class of gamma is equivalent to the conjugacy class of gamma inverse. Okay, so this set here is naturally uh, in bijection with the set of free homotopy classes of unoriented closed curves on your surface. Okay, so if you choose a hyperbolic structure on your surface, then this becomes, uh, is naturally the, the set of closed geodesics on your surface, right? Because every free homotopy class contains a unique geodesic representative. Okay, so um, I call this the set of closed geodesics, but really this is a topological thing. Okay, so the length functions are mapped from here uh, to R plus. And what you do is you just take um, any equivalence class containing the group element gamma. So this is the closed geodesic corresponding to gamma. And you send it to the sum from i equals to 1 to n minus 1 of a i times log of the ith eigenvalue of rho of gamma divided by the i plus 1 eigenvalue of rho of gamma. Okay? So um, you can check that this uh, map is well defined. Okay, you need this condition to make it well defined. Okay, so an example of, uh, yeah, so maybe I should remark that this length function depends on the choice of my AIs, okay, but I will suppress that in the notation, all right? So um, an example of this right, is uh, in the case when n equals to 2. Okay, when n equals to 2, your second hitching component is exactly tight in the space, okay? This is a consequence of the well-known fact that tight in the space is a connected component of X2S, okay? So this is tight in the space, and in this case, I only have one choice of the AI, so I just choose A1, and say, let's say I choose it to be 1, Okay, then, uh, the, then uh, for any closed geodesic C in CGS, okay, the row length of C is exactly the hyperbolic length 
of the closed geodesic C. Okay? In the hyperbolic structure corresponding to my Fuchsian representation row. Okay? So these are the kind of things that I'm interested in studying. Right? I would like to understand uh, the length functions, these guys, that arise from uh, Hitchin representations, or in general, from these things we call positively ratio representations. Okay, and if this is the kind of thing you're interested in, one a natural quantity uh, that you would like to understand is this thing called the entropy of the representation. Okay, so definition for any uh, Hitchin representation row. Ah. Okay, and uh, for any choice of, again, you need to choose some AIs, right, with this symmetry, but I won't write that here. Okay, the entropy of the representation is defined in the following way. Okay, first you count the number of closed geodesics. on your surface, okay, whose row length is less than some number t. Okay, and for any t, this quantity turns out to be finite, okay, for Hitchin representations, and in fact, it grows exponentially with t. Okay, so you take the exponential growth rate. Okay, so this quantity is called the entropy. Now, um, it's another well-known thing about the tagmuller space that this quantity here is constant on tagmuller space. Okay, so this is kind of a boring quantity to look at if you're interested in tagmuller space. However, once you uh, change your Lie group right to become a higher rank, right for PSL nr where n is three and bigger, then this quantity is no longer constant. Okay, in fact, uh, it's a consequence of my uh, thesis result that uh, when n is at least three. Okay, and um, and let's say you choose, uh, okay, now you need to choose all the AIs to be one. Okay, so in other words, uh, the length function I'm considering uh, is the one that assigns to every uh, uh, closed curve, right, the log of the top eigenvalue of rho of gamma divided by the bottom eigenvalue of rho of gamma. Okay, so if you choose this particular length function, okay, then uh, there exists a sequence in the Hitchin component Right, along which your topological entropy, your entropy would converge to zero. Okay, and also uh, Sinier also produced um, other examples of these things. So produced other examples, right, where your entropy is going to zero uh, in the case when n equals to three. Okay, using other constructions. So um, for me, a natural question then is, uh, for these length functions, right, can I give a criterion on a sequence of representations to indicate when is the entropy along that sequence converging to zero? Okay, so the question, when uh, is there a criterion uh, for when this happens? Okay, um, just over there. <clears throat> okay, and so uh, we, we could not answer this uh, question completely, okay, but um, we got pretty close, okay? If you restrict yourself to just sequences that stay in the epsilon thick part of the Hitchin component, okay, then it turns out that we have a criterion, okay? so. Um, First, I need to tell you what the epsilon thick part is, okay? So this is a corollary of some theorems that I'm going to state later, okay? Um, if, so if for any epsilon larger than zero, okay, you define uh, the epsilon thick part of the Hitchin component, okay, to be uh, the set of Hitchin representations, <coughs> right, where the row length of any closed geodesic is at least epsilon. Okay, and of course, this again depends on the choice of the AIs, right? But uh, every time you choose an AI, you can define this epsilon thick part. Okay? Okay, then now you let a uh, row I uh, be a sequence in this epsilon thick part. Let row I be a sequence in here. Then the entropy along this sequence converges to zero 
if and only if, for any subsequence, Uh, of this sequence, okay, there exists the following things. Okay, first, a further subsequence okay, which I will abuse notation and also denote by row i. Okay, a possibly empty collection in the space of closed Jurassics uh, that are pairwise, non-intersecting and simple. Okay, and finally, um, uh, a sequence of mapping classes. Okay, such that. All right, so, so before I uh, write the condition, uh, let me just say that the mapping class group acts on the hitching component, just like how it acts on packing the space, okay, by remarking. Right, and also um, for any length function you choose, right, the, uh, the, the mapping class group preserves the epsilon thick part of the hitching component as well. Okay? So you need these three things satisfying the following, okay? Read, write bigger? Okay. Okay, so first, um, if you look at the supremum, over all, uh, all elements in your subsequence, right? This further subsequence, okay? And you look at the maximum over all curves in this possibly empty collection, okay? Uh, of the fi times rho i length of your closed geodesics in here, okay? This has to be finite. And second, if you take the limit as i approaches infinity, so you move along your sequence, and you look at the minimum, okay, over all closed geodesics, okay, they are in the complement in S of your collection of closed curves. Okay, so S minus C is a possibly disconnected uh, union of surfaces with boundary, okay, and I've defined closed geodesics only for closed surfaces, but obviously you can define it for surfaces with boundary as well. And I require these guys to be non peripheral. Okay, and then you look at the fi times rho i length of all these guys. Okay, this has to be infinite. Okay, so this is the criterion. So more informally, what is this saying, right? This is saying that if I take a sequence in the epsilon thick part of the hitching component, right, then the entropy along this sequence is going to zero, if and only if up to taking subsequences and up to the mapping class group, okay? You can find some way to cut your surface into pieces, Maybe something like that. Okay, so that the lengths of the curves that you use to cut your surface have to remain finite along your sequence. But on the complementary pieces, right, the shortest, I mean the, the systole length, the shortest non-peripheral closed curve, its length has to go to infinity. Okay, so this is kind of a pretty easy criterion, I think. So, um, yeah, okay, so maybe I should move on from now. Okay, so this is a, a, a statement of a corollary of our main theorem in the setting of Hitchin representations. Okay? Um, after, so this was initially the, the, our target, right? This was something we wanted to prove. And after we proved this, we realized that our techniques actually generalized to a much more general setting. Okay, and that's how we came up with these things we call positively ratio representations. Okay, so uh, before I move on, I want to say a little bit about the, the strategy of proving a corollary like this, or a theorem like this, okay? I mean, if you try to work on this, very quickly you realize that your life would be a lot easier if you knew that your length functions came from a negatively curved metric on the surface, okay? And sometimes that happens, right? In the case when n equals to two, right, your length functions, I said, you know, they will arose as length functions of, an, of a hyperbolic metric on your surface, okay? But in general, Right, there is no canonical metric on your surface that gives rise to these length functions. Okay? But we have something close. It turns out that these length functions arise from 
uh, geodesic currents, right? And that is good enough, right, for you to play a lot of this entropy counting, uh, this entropy counting game. Okay, and so let me um, explain what geodesic currents are. We kind of saw, uh, kind of saw this yesterday during Viveka's talk. Uh, but in case you missed it, um, I'm gonna. Uh, there's gonna be a lot of overlap of what I do here with what she did. Okay, so first, what are these guys? So a geodesic current. Right, is a uh, gamma invariant, uh, locally finite, Borel measure on the space of geodesics in the universal cover of S. Okay, so uh, this guy is defined to be the set of unordered pairs in the boundary of my group. Okay, that are pairwise distinct. Okay, so if you choose a hyperbolic metric on your surface, then this again is naturally identified with the set of geodesics in the universal cover. Okay, but again, this is a topological thing. Okay, this has a, I mean, has a, there's a natural gamma action on this space because this is a pair of points in the boundary of the group. There's a topology here as well, okay, because the boundary of the group has a natural topology. And so this makes sense. All right, so and what's an example of this? Uh, the easiest examples are those that come from uh, closed geodesics on your, uh, those the um, geodesic currents that you can associate to closed geodesics on your surface. Okay, so for any uh, closed geodesic, my surface, okay, uh, let eta be a group element that is primitive. Okay, so that uh, if you look at the equivalence class, uh, the equivalence, the, the closed geodesic, corresponding to eta to the k, this is c, right, for, uh, for some uh, positive integer k. Okay, so uh, in the case when c is primitive, then k is 1. Okay, but this, I, I kind of keep track of how many times c winds around itself as well. Okay, then in this case, um, the, med, the geodesic current I associate to the closed geodesic c, okay, is uh, sometimes I also abuse notation, denote this just by c, this is defined to be k times the sum over all elements in your group right, of the Dirac measure on gamma times eta minus, gamma times eta plus, right, where eta minus and eta plus are the attracting and refilling fixed points of this group element in the boundary. Okay, so let me kind of draw a picture of what I'm saying here. Right, so um, you have your surface downstairs, okay, and you choose uh, this curve C, this closed curve, this closed geodesic. I want to assign a geodesic current to this guy, right? So you just look in the universal cover, okay, and you look at all the possible lifts of this geodesic upstairs. Okay, something like this. You know, it goes there are infinitely many. Okay, so something like this is eta minus, this is eta plus. Maybe this is gamma times eta minus, gamma times eta plus, and so on. Okay, and on this infinite set of geodesics, you just put the Dirac measure on all of them. You take the sum and you scale everything by k. Okay, this turns out to be a geodesic current. Okay, so what you've done is you've taken the space of closed geodesics and put them inside of the space of geodesic currents. Okay, now definition. Uh, Bonnehan defined uh, a very nice intersection pairing on the space of geodesic currents. Okay, so there exists a, a continuous, a symmetric, bilinear pairing, uh, I, okay, from Cs times Cs, R, uh, non-negative, okay, that generalizes um, the geometric intersection number. Okay, meaning that if I take this uh, intersection pairing and I just restrict it to the geodesic currents that I, uh, that I get from the closed geodesics, then this is exactly the geometric intersection number. Okay? So, of course, you know, he gives a, a definition on how to, de you know, an actual proper definition of this, but I won't do that in the interest of time. Okay? So, for us, what this gives us is a way to define a length function given any geodesic current. 
Okay, so um, uh, this implies that uh, for any geodesic current, okay, you can define the length function L nu. And just like the length functions we define for Hitchin representations, right, this is a map from the set of closed geodesics on my surface to R greater than or equal to zero. And you just take uh, every closed geodesic and you look at its intersection pairing right, with this geodesic current. Okay? <clears throat> Now, I'm going to impose another condition on the geodesic currents I'm considering. Okay, and this one's important. Uh, uh, a, a geodesic current nu, yes. Okay, it's called period minimizing. Okay, if for any positive number t, okay, the number uh, of closed geodesics. whose lengths are less than uh, t is finite. Okay, so examples of uh, period minimizing geodesic currents are the Liu-View currents, right? Those that come from negatively curved metrics on my surface, where right? we saw that yesterday. Non-examples are measured laminations, right? For measured laminations, you cannot, there's no minimum for this. Uh, I mean, for any, if you make t arbitrarily small, this is still always infinite, okay? So for my purposes, you know, you should think of a Liu view currents as a, as good, measured laminations as bad. Okay, so, um, well, what is the advantage of looking at the length functions of um, of uh, geodesic currents versus the length functions coming from representations, right? And the thing is, uh, the, it turns out that when you are when you have a geodesic current that's period minimizing, you can pretty much pretend right, that, you can, that, the, that your length function comes from a length function on a, of, a met, of a negatively curved metric on the surface. Okay, so uh, let me give a, an example of a proposition of something like this. Okay, so let C be a closed geodesic on my surface. Okay, and uh, I'll let uh, that is non-simple. Okay, and then uh, let C1, C2, C3 be close to the six, right, that are obtained right, by performing surgery uh, to my non-simple close to the six C right, at a self-intersection point. Okay, so uh, I'll draw a picture to, to explain what I'm doing. Okay, so suppose that this is your non-simple closed geodesic C, okay, and you have some self-intersection point. Right, then there is a few ways you can cut C into pieces at this self-intersection point, right, two ways. You can cut it vertically like this, and this will give you uh, two closed geodesics like this. Okay, I'm going to call this C1 and C2. Okay, but you can also cut it horizontally like this. Right, and this gives you a third closed geodesic, like this, and this is C3. Okay, and the statement is that for any geodesic current, without any assumptions at all, okay, um, the new length of C is always at least the new length of C1 plus the new length of C2, and it's also at least, okay, maybe, uh, and also at least the new length of C3. Okay, furthermore, if the geodesic current nu has the property that nu of u is positive for every open set u uh, in the space of geodesics in S tilde, okay, then the inequality is strict. Okay, so if you have a negatively curved metric on the surface, then something like this is obviously true, right? Because once you cut, uh, your curves do not, do not change length, and then you pull it tight so they become shorter. Okay, 
turns out that in the space, if you work in the world of geodesic currents, you can also prove something like this. It's not so hard. Okay, but proving a proposition like this in the world of um, representations, right, is surprisingly tricky. Okay, so that's, why, that's one uh, advantage you have, right, when you think of length functions of geodesic currents versus length functions coming from representations. Okay, and this is a, a point I would like to emphasize, right, for most of the other examples, that, uh, say, Vivica showed us yesterday, right, about geodesic currents, a lot of them, right, they arise, you know, when you, you already have a metric on your space, on, on your surface, right, for which the length functions come from. Okay, but for here, you don't have a metric on your surface, right, and that's why, you know, proving something like this, right, is easier to do in the world of geodesic currents. Uh, yeah, okay. So, um, that's that. Okay, so this proposition gives us uh, the following consequence, right, if you take a period minimizing geodesic current, okay, uh, and say a, a subsurface, okay, a geodesic subsurface, so let uh, S prime in S be a geodesic subsurface, okay, meaning uh, uh, if you choose a negatively curved metric on S, Okay, then S prime can be homotoped to a totally geodesic subsurface in the usual Riemannian geometry sense. Okay, if you have something like this, okay, then there exists a Pan's decomposition. Uh, okay, let me not call it P. I call it C1 to CK. So it's a bunch of uh, closed curves, simple closed curves in S prime. Okay, so that the new length of uh, Cj for any j is uh, at least the new length of C for any uh, closed geodesic C uh, in the complement of uh, the previous curves in S prime. Okay, so, so what am I doing here, right? How do I build such a Pan's decomposition? Well, you start off uh, with your uh, subsurface. Okay, so let me draw a picture. Subsurface um, looks something maybe like this. Okay, so your subsurface can be the whole thing and then you're closed, right? But typically you have boundary, okay? And then now you look at all the non-peripheral closed curves in here and you find the shortest one, okay? That exists because you're period minimizing. Okay, now this proposition, right? Where did it go? Yeah, this proposition ensures that, okay, so you, it ensures that either this is already a pair of pens, or you can choose your shortest simple guy, or your shortest closed geodesic that's non-peripheral to be simple, okay? Because uh, if, you, if your shortest one is non-simple, you just cut, right, to make it smaller. Okay, unless you're a pair of pens, then you cannot do it anymore. Right, now you cut your surface here, Okay, and then you get another geodesic subsurface, you iterate, okay, until you get a Pan's decomposition. Okay, so I don't know. Something like this. Okay, <clears throat> and this is called a minimal Pan's decomposition. Questions? Okay. With this, I can make several definitions. Um, some, I'm going to define certain quantities associated to a period minimizing geodesic current. Okay, so uh, for this definition, I need my geodesic current to be period minimizing and S prime a geodesic subsurface. Okay, then first I can define the systole length, right? So this is L nu S prime. This is defined to be the set of closed geodesics. Uh, sorry, it's defined to be the minimum. Right, of the new length of C, such as C is a closed geodesic, S prime. Okay, the shortest closed curve, uh, the, the length of the shortest closed geodesic. Okay, and you can define uh, the, the, the entropy, right, just like how we defined it for Hitchin representations, okay? So H new S prime right, is defined uh, to be the exponential growth rate Right, of the number of closed geodesics, right, whose new length is less than t. Okay, 
So this is the entropy. And finally, we can define a third quantity using our minimal Pan's decomposition, which we call the pen system length. Okay. So third, for any uh, minimal Pan's decomposition, D of S prime, okay, uh, I define K nu of S prime, right, to be uh, uh, the uh, length, the new length of the closed geodesics in S prime, okay, so that um, uh, the C that is not, let's just say this, that is not a peri, that is not a multiple uh, of a simple closed curve in P and uh, non peripheral. Okay, this is called the pentad system length. So basically, I look at my surface. I have my minimal pants decomposition. I look at all the closed geodesic in here and I remove the guys that are just multiples of curves in my pants decomposition or multiples of curves in my boundary. Okay, ignore those guys. Among the rest, I find the shortest one and that's the pentad system length. Okay, and uh, the theorem that we can prove is the following. Okay, so uh, that new be a period, period minimizing geodesic current. I uh, see, yeah, period minimizing geodesic current. Okay, S prime and S, a geodesic subsurface. Right, and uh, E, a um, minimize, minimal pens decomposition. for S prime. Okay, minimal with respect to this geodesic current, this period minimizing geodesic current new. Okay, if this is true, uh, in this setting, then you have the following inequality. Okay, log 2 over 4 is at most uh, the pentad system length rescaled by the entropy uh, of my subsurface. Okay, and this is, oh, sorry, I forgot, I forgot the most important thing. Okay, so there exists a constant C depending only on the topology of your surface, okay, such that for any period minimizing geodesic current and for any geodesic subsurface and for any minimal pen decomposition, okay, you have this uh, inequality that the, the pentad system length renormalized by the entropy okay, is bounded above by this constant uh, times one uh, times five, sorry, plus um, plus the log of 1 plus square root of 5 plus 1 over 2, multiplied by the ratio of the pentad system length to the system length. Okay, so let me point out a few features of this inequality. First, this inequality right, is, uh, is invariant under scaling. Okay, so if I take my geodesic current and I scale it, right, then the entropy, let's say I scale my geodesic current by k, the entropy will be scaled down by 1 over k, and this guy will be scaled up by k, right? So nothing happens. And of course, uh, these are ratios of certain lengths, right? So the, when you scale, nothing happens here as well. Okay, so this is really an inequality uh, on the space of projectivized geodesic currents. Okay? So this might look uh, kind of strange, right? But let me uh, give you some consequences. First, if I don't care about the, if I don't care about um, uh, the the system length, uh, the pentad system length, I only care about the system length, then you can actually make this uh, much simpler. Okay, there exists a constant c depending only on the topology of my geodesic subsurface. Okay, such that for any period minimizing geodesic current, okay, the system length. I renormalize uh, by the entropy bounded above by C. Okay? <clears throat> so in particular, I mean, so yeah, I should say this. In the case when S prime is a closed surface, 
and nu is the Liu view current, right? Then I've been told that this inequality can be abstracted from the current literature. Okay, so something like this might not be entirely new, but I've not seen anything close to uh, this inequality before. So if you have, you should let me know as well. Okay? What this implies, right, if, is that if I have a subset of a geodesic currents, and I know I have a uniform lower bound away from zero of the entropy, right, then that would give me a uniform upper bound of the system length. Okay, and that will have consequences for us later as well. Okay, now a second corollary, right, is that, uh, is that the analog of the corollary I wrote down for Hitchin representations just now holds in this setting. Okay, so um, first, uh, for any epsilon larger than zero, I need to define for you what is the epsilon thick part of the geodesic currents, right? So I'll uh, define A sub epsilon of S prime to be the geodesic currents, the period minimizing geodesic currents. Okay, so that uh, the new length of C is larger than epsilon for any closed geodesic in my subsurface S prime. Okay, and then, uh, okay, I did not name that, that corollary just now, but I guess you guys know what I'm talking about. So let's say the, the Hitchin corollary, the, uh, the H corollary. So the corollary in, uh, that I first wrote down, right, in the setting of Hitchin representations, right, holds. Okay, uh, when um, uh, with, uh, let's see, with uh, the epsilon thick part of the Hitchin component, they replaced uh, with this guy here, A epsilon S prime, right? And uh, you just change all your sequences of representations with sequences of geodesic currents. Okay? <clears throat> So with this uh, corollary, okay, so maybe I should say a little bit of why these things are true, okay? So <clears throat> basically, if you are in the epsilon thick part, right, of the, of the geodesic currents, right, this ensures that L nu S prime cannot be too small, okay? Then you divide your inequality throughout by K nu S prime, right? Then on both sides, right, you're going to have some expression in terms of K nu S prime, right, that goes to zero if and only if K nu S prime goes to infinity, Okay? And then using that, you can, uh, you can play around a little bit and you can show this corollary holds as well. Any questions so far? Okay, so with this corollary, right, the only thing we need to do now, right, is to, relate, is to bring my representations into the picture. Okay, everything is in Jurassic current world so far, right? So how do you associate, uh, how do you relate the length functions you have from your representations to the geodesic currents, right? And this is uh, where we realize that what we did actually works in a much more general setting. Okay, and so these are uh, positively ratioed representations. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a definition of this. Uh, but to do that, I need uh, some basics from Lee theory. Okay, so I'm gonna. Uh, so if you're not so familiar with uh, Lee theory, right? Don't worry because I'll I'll do a running example alongside what I'm gonna do. Okay, so I'll let G be a semi-simple Lee group of non-compact type. Okay, and K is going to be a maximal compact subgroup. Okay, and then A is going to be the, a maximal abelian subspace of the perp of the Lie algebra of K, which lives inside of G. Okay, so this guy is the Lie algebra of K, this guy is the Lie algebra of G. Here I'm taking the perp with respect to the killing form. Okay, so this guy is, lies in here, is a maximal abelian subspace. Okay, and then I have a choice of simple roots, which I call delta. Right, and on the set of simple roots, I have the opposition involution, right, which I denote by yota. Okay, so example. Uh, you can take G to be PSL4R. Okay, K to be PSO4. Running out of chalk again. 
okay? And then A in this case is going to be the set of uh, four by four diagonal matrices that are traceless. Okay, so this is a uh, three-dimensional vector space. All right, and uh, what else do I need? So a delta, right? Uh, in this case, you're gonna have three simple roots, alpha one, alpha two, alpha three. Okay, and each simple root is a map from, uh, it's a linear map from this vector space to R. Okay, and what you do is you take your diagonal matrix right, and you send it to AI minus AI plus one. Okay, so each root takes uh, the difference in the adjacent entries along my diagonal. Okay, and these are the simple roots, particular linear functions on these guys. Okay, and then uh, the opposition involution in this case right, takes each uh, simple root and sends it to alpha 4 minus i. Okay, so you take alpha 1 to alpha 3, alpha 3 to alpha 1, and alpha 2 is fixed. Okay, so this is uh, the running example. Now, uh, for any theta subset of delta, okay, you can get two things from theta. One is this thing called a parabolic subgroup. Okay, in fact, all parabolic subgroups are gonna be conjugate to one of these guys, right? And you also get this projection pi theta, right, from uh, A to A theta, which is defined to be the subset of A, right, so that um, alpha of x is zero for any alpha simple root that is not in theta. Okay, so let me uh, do our example again. So suppose that theta is all of delta. Okay, then in this case, uh, P theta, P delta is my uh, upper the upper triangular matrices, PSL four R. Okay, this is my parabolic subgroup, and uh, my projection is just the identity map in this case from A to A. Okay, but suppose that in the case when delta theta is alpha two. Okay, then P of alpha two, right, is the the set of matrices, right, where the bottom two by two corner is zero. So this is in PSL 4R. Okay, and your projection, right, now it takes uh, A to A alpha two. Okay, and what you do is you take your diagonal matrix and you send it to the following, okay? You, you basically take the first two entries and you take the average and you put it there. So A1 plus A2 over two, A1 plus A2 over two. Okay, and the last two entries, you take the average of these two and put them there. I'm sorry, I think I wrote too small here. Okay, but let me just, in case you can't read, I'll just say that you take uh, A1, A2, you take the average, and you put the same thing in the first two entries here. Take A3, A4, you take the average, and you put the same thing here. Okay, so this uh, lands in A theta, uh, A of alpha two, right? Because uh, if you evaluate alpha one and alpha three here, you always get zero, right? Uh-oh, okay. So one last thing before I, well, two last things before I, I, I tell you the definition. Okay, I need this thing called the Jordan projection. Okay, and this is a map, I denote by lambda, from G to the positive vowel chamber in my Lie algebra, uh, in, my, in my maximal uh, abelian subspace. Okay, and uh, in the example, okay, so this is given to you by the Jordan decomposition theorem. Okay, and what this uh, is in the example, so let me uh, make it simpler, okay? Suppose that a G in PSL4R uh, is diagonalizable.
over R, okay, with eigenvalues, uh, with absolute value lambda 1 to lambda 4. Okay? Then uh, lambda g right, is going to be the, the uh, diagonal matrix, which is the logarithm of the absolute value of lambda 1 to the logarithm of the absolute value of lambda 4. Okay? So, I mean, PSL4, the product of these guys is 1. So when you take the log, the sum is 0. Okay? So this is a traceless matrix as well. Okay? <clears throat> last thing. Okay, last one, last one. Okay, I'm going to define for you a notion of cross-ratio. Okay, okay, there are many uh, definitions of cross-ratios out there, but the one I'm using right, is the one by Lett Rapier. Okay, so a cross-ratio right, is a continuous map B, okay, from quadruples of points in the boundary of the group Okay, so that the first two points and the last two points do not share any common points. Okay, so A can be B, but A cannot be C and A cannot be D. Okay, so it's a map from this set to R, okay, satisfying a few conditions. The first one is a, um, is a symmetry condition. So B of A, B, C, D has to be equal to B of C, D, a, B, okay, for whenever this is defined. And second, uh, you have a co-cycle condition. So B of A, B, C, D plus B of A, B, D, E equals to B of A, B, C, E. Okay. So this is all the setup I need. Next, I'm going to state a proposition which is probably the deepest thing I'm stating right now. And this is a, I mean, okay, so it basically follows, okay, from uh, the work of Ka. Did I say that right? Okay. Uh, San Marino. Okay, uh, Ursula Hammerstein. And Let Rapier, François Let Rapier. Okay, so the, the hardest part of this proposition is really to understand what these four people did and combine everything together. Okay, and what it says is the following, okay? So let theta in delta be a subset of the roots, right? Such that it's invariant under the opposition involution. Okay, and then uh, also for any alpha in theta, okay, I let the symmetrized alpha, alpha sim, right, to be defined to be the sum of alpha and its image under the opposition involution. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so we have this. Now, uh, then the statement is that uh, if rho from gamma to g is p theta and north of. Okay, so, you know, having nice geometric properties with respect to this parabolic subgroup. Okay, then there exists a cross ratio. That denote by B theta alpha, okay, uh, with the property that B theta alpha of um, such that uh, let's say for, let's say this way for any gamma uh, non-identity element in the group, okay, B theta alpha of gamma minus gamma plus. So this is the repelling and attracting fixed point of my group element in the boundary of the group, and then gamma x and x. Okay, so x here is just any element in the boundary that is not gamma minus and gamma plus. Okay, you can check that this quantity here doesn't depend on the choice of x. Okay, this here is, for example, this is called uh, the period of the cross ratio. Okay, this quantity is equal to the following. Okay, you take your group element, you evaluate it using the representation. Okay, then you hit it by the Jordan projection to let it land inside the positive valve chamber. And then you hit it by the projection pi theta. Okay, and then you hit it by the root. Okay, so this thing looks really scary, okay, but what is this really? 
this is a, a length function. Okay, if you work out the examples that I wrote down, the example of PSL4 just now that I wrote down, right, you can see that in all those cases, right, this, quant this quantity here is just uh, the logarithm of certain ratios and products of eigenvalues of rho of gamma. Okay, so this here is really a length function. So what this is saying is that whenever you have, uh, you make these choices, right, choose a theta and an alpha like this, okay, then the length function that you get, right, always comes from a cross ratio. Okay? No, no, it, it does not. Like if PSL, NR for N even, you... Wait, wait, say that, sorry? So, uh, for any uh -huh. the involution on the set, uh -huh. does it always have a fixed length? No. Because you're using the length function. No, so, so theta is not a fixed point, it's a fixed subset. So you can take theta to be all of delta, then that will be fixed, right? Okay? <sighs> okay, so with this proposition, now I can write down my definition. Okay? Uh, a P theta, a North South representation. Rho from gamma to G. Okay, is a P theta positively ratio. Yes? Don't use the... Oh, 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> this is alpha sim. Yeah, that's important. Okay, here, I, I, I hit it with a symmetrized root. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. So if you have a North of representation like this, then this is called p theta positively ratio. If um, for any alpha in theta, okay, the cross ratio b theta alpha, which is uh, guaranteed by that proposition, okay, evaluated on any four points in the boundary of the group in that order. Okay, so this is uh, this has to be greater than or equal to zero for any a b c d in the boundary of the group in this order. Okay, so the boundary of the group is topologically a circle, right? So I'm just saying that if you take A, B, C, D, four points like this, and I evaluate it using the cross ratio, this always has to be non-negative. Okay? And the upshot from this, right, is, uh, okay, I mean, this is a, a very fundamental principle. It's, you know, it's something like uh, if you have finite additivity, right, and you have non-negativity, then you have countable additivity. Okay? So uh, let me just state, uh, state this as an observation by Ursula Hammerstein. Okay, that uh, if B right, is a cross ratio, okay, such that uh, B of A, B, C, D uh, is non-negative for any quadruple A, B, C, D in the boundary of the group, okay, then um, there exists a geodesic current. Okay, so that uh, when you do the intersection of this current right, with any closed curve corresponding to the group element gamma, okay, this is the period of your cross ratio, of your cross ratio. It's B of uh, gamma minus, gamma plus, gamma x, x for any non-identity element in your group. Okay, so whenever you have a positively ratio representation, right, then the cross ratios you get, you can always associate geodesic currents to them. Okay, and this is how everything goes through. Everything you do in the world of geodesic currents, right, will work here. Okay, so uh, I'm out of, almost out of time, but maybe I should say what the examples of these positively ratio representations are. Okay, so you have Hitchin representations, which I first introduced, and these are uh, positively ratio with respect to any parabolic subgroup. But you also have the maximum representations in there. Right? These are the ones that Beatrice Posetti was telling, about us, telling us about on Tuesday. Okay, those are all positively ratioed with respect to 
uh, the stabilizer of a Lagrangian subspace. Okay, then you can build more by taking certain direct sums and tensors of these representations. Okay, and the basic uh, reason you can do that is because if I have two uh, cross ratios with this property, and then you add them, you get another cross ratio with this property again. Okay, so you can build many, many more representations that way. All right? Uh, so, but uh, an, an important non-example are quasi-function representations. Okay, if you take a quasi-function representation, that is a Nossoff with respect to the line and hyperplane stabilizer, and you can define the cross ratio as well. Okay, but as once you're non-function, right, then this cross ratio cannot be positive. Right, basically, the, the, how bad your limit curve is, right, ruins the positivity. Okay, and so this kind of uh, trick doesn't apply for quasi-function representations. Okay, so I should stop here. Thank you.